guys! If you're new here, I'm Anna, and I scored a perfect 1600 on my SAT back in 2020. Since then, I've been giving all the advice and tips I have to help you guys do the same. Now that the SAT is fully digital, it's time for a revamped version of my old SAT math section video. I have one specific new strategy that, if you know, can improve your score by hundreds of points, so be sure to stay tuned until the end for that. So, the math modules. They're arguably more straightforward than the reading modules, but they require more base knowledge of algebra and geometry, so it makes it harder to fake your way through it with just good test-taking strategy. You kind of have to know what's going on. If you're still struggling with some of the core concepts on this section and are trying to improve your math score by more than 100 points, I'm going to recommend doing a lot of prep with Khan Academy's digital SAT practice because it's online, it's free, super easily accessible, and it does a pretty good job of replicating the questions that are actually on the exam and teaching you the concepts behind them. But for an even better, more accurate question bank, more detailed explanations, and a more personalized interface, I'd recommend checking out Prep Scholar. Prep Scholar is what I use to get a perfect score on the math and the reading section, and their test prep content is made by very high scorers on the SAT who understand the test incredibly well, so they can help you improve whether you're trying to go from a 500 to a 700 on this section, or a 770 to an 800. You can get $50 off either their online SAT or ACT prep course by using the link in my description. I've been recommending their program to all my friends and the entire internet before they started sponsoring this channel. They're just awesome, and checking them out really helps this channel out, and they're a very high quality resource, so I guarantee checking them out will help you as well. Anyway, moving on from the resources you can use to prepare, let's talk about study strategy. Whether you're on Khan Academy or Prep Scholar, or you're slogging through the many digital SAT practice tests that they have, there's six of them now, by the way, it's imperative that you're writing down every single mistake you're making and how you're gonna avoid making that mistake in the future. Back in the day, I would do this in a little notebook and on a spreadsheet because I'm extra, but either or works or whatever way you want to keep track of this stuff. And to do this properly, you first need to characterize the types of mistakes on this section. So I would say there's three main types of mistakes that you can be making, but if you have a different way to characterize these, feel free to use that. I'd say that there's first the careless mistakes, then the ones that are slightly more rooted in not understanding the problem or not knowing how to tackle that type of question. And then there's the more deep-rooted issues, like you're missing a fundamental skill in your math repertoire and you have to work on that. It's really important to categorize what every single mistake you're making is after you make it, and to be really self-aware and honest with yourself when you're doing this. Even though it can be uncomfortable and it really sucks doing this, it'll really help you. This will give you a better understanding of if you have a really weak section or two on the test that you need to improve on. Like maybe you don't know radicals that well and you can review that one topic. And it can also show you if you don't really have any of these deep-rooted understanding issues and that you just need to be working on your time management or checking your work better. This will show you how to portion your time out when you're studying. Your time is valuable, you have better things to be doing than studying for the SAT, so you should be using it wisely when you're studying because it's all about quality over quantity. I'd recommend making a little key for this, color coding it, it, doing whatever to make it fun for yourself. Be sure to write down the question or a little part of the question to give your future self context. Write down the answer that you thought was correct and then the answer that's actually correct. When I was doing this, I would write down any formula that could lead to shortcuts in solving the problems that I was getting wrong or the formulas that you legitimately need to solve a problem. And especially for the ones that were more deep-rooted issues, I would write down step-by-step step how to solve that problem in my little book. And to get this information, you can go to the answer explanations of any of the official tests that College Board releases. That'll give you very detailed information about the category the question is and more of a step-by-step walking you through the question. So for the careless mistakes, try to be as specific as possible on where you're going wrong. Don't just put down, I was being dumb. Put, I was being dumb by misinterpreting the value I was supposed to be solving for as the x-intercept instead of the y-intercept. Next time, I'll carefully write down or highlight the value I'm supposed to be solving for, more carefully read the question, and double check that I'm solving for that correct value when I'm finished with the problem. This gives you actionable steps to improve yourself and ways to prevent those silly mistakes. Once you do this, you'll have a reference that you can look back on, a refresher of all the formulas you'll need to review in one place right before test day. Back in the day, I did this mistakes method for practically every single SAT thing I could get my hands on. So like the PSAT 10 and the practice booklet my school gave me, my daily Khan Academy practice, college board official tests, and later prep scholar when I started using that. I like to have a lot of fun with my advice column for these. And I did beat myself up a little bit, especially for the careless mistakes. But just remember to be kind to yourself when you're doing this 
As goofy as I was some of the time with this method, I was really able to notice some of my recurring mistakes and get a better sense of the topics that I was commonly making mistakes on. And for the most challenging problems of the test, rephrasing the answers and the explanations and having to work them out yourself and almost pretend you're teaching it to yourself helps so much more than just reading them over. It's all about getting to a state of deep concentration when you're reviewing, instead of just surface level telling yourself, oh, I won't make that mistake again, that was stupid. If it's hard for you to do this on your own, try getting together with some supportive friends to go over your mistakes, or just explain the problems you got wrong to your parents, your siblings, your cat, whoever, because teaching it to somebody else will make sure that you understand the concept enough to teach it. And who knows, maybe your cat will have some good insight on a problem and give you a new perspective. So now I'm gonna rapid fire give you some of my most common mistakes and some advice I have in preventing those. So first piece of advice, always read through the whole problem before you try to answer it. I would get really overexcited on some of these and kind of end up speed running the problem just to realize later that I solved for the wrong variable, didn't round to the nearest tenth, or something silly like that. The SAT is designed to trick you like this. So just be careful when you're reading and be skeptical when something seems too easy. A lot of the time it is that easy, but sometimes, Every once in a while, you've just misread the problem. Also, read all the answer choices, because sometimes these can help you prevent a careless mistake. All the math SAT answer choices always look pretty similar to each other, but there's always a few key differences that make them unique. So if you're not paying super close attention, you could end up selecting the wrong one, even if you got the correct answer. Pay really careful attention to phrases like did versus did not, and specifically in the table questions where they ask you to calculate probability, make sure you're working with the correct categories and select the correct numbers in that table. Next, always make sure your answer choices seem reasonable. The main skill to get good at to improve your score, once you already know the content, is guesstimation. This is especially relevant to the real life word type problems that they'll give you, because the SAT usually sticks to real life logic with these. So you should be doing a double take if you select an outrageous answer. This type of question shows up a lot nowadays. It's like a classic unit conversion question involving square units. We know conceptually how big a mile is, and a park being 3,000 or 6,000 miles squared seems a little crazy if this is a typical park. We know we're probably gonna end up with a one or three square mile park. But if we were a little careless, or if we didn't know that to convert square units, you wanna divide or multiply by the unit conversion squared, we might only divide by 1760 once and get the 6,000 square mile park. But alarm bells should be going off in your head if you select that answer choice, because that is a very large park. And then upon closer examination, we realize we should have divided by 1760 squared, which gives us the much more reasonable 3.83 square mile park. Having a good intuition like this can occasionally save you on a problem. Now, here's my best piece of advice. It's about Desmos, the calculator that they give you on this section now. This is by far the best way to get fast score improvements. I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't start using Desmos to the fullest extent until my sophomore year of college. Once I did, mm, exponential boost in grades. It's a very valuable tool that will serve you for years beyond the SAT, especially if you're going into a STEM field. So I would recommend using it whenever you can for your math homework and any simple math you have to do to get used to the interface. The thing I didn't realize until way later than I should have is that you can use it like a normal calculator too, not just a graphing calculator. So while I still recommend bringing your own calculator to the test if you're more used to that, if you have time to get used to entering math in on Desmos, it's so much faster and leads to a lot fewer careless mistakes because you can more easily see what you're typing in and you don't have to worry as much about order of operations like you do on a calculator. Now, graphing wise and non-graphing wise, let's just go through a few examples to show you how valuable and overpowered this tool that they give to you is. Okay, so for the simplest, most basic type of problem you can plug into Desmos, it's gonna be these system of linear equations problems. So basically just plug them both in and then look for the intersection point. That's gonna be three 100, and that's literally your answer. There's no need to solve these out ever anymore when you have Desmos. So you can also use it for the more complicated graphing problems. So for this one, we're trying to find what C equals. And we know there's gonna be a line Y equals C that intersects with this first equation. So if we just set it to one for now, we can change it. We see that these two don't intersect, but if we change this slider, we can see that they intersect at about C equals negative 80. If we want to get more accurate, let's plug in some of our answer choices and see. Yep, that looks right. So C is negative 319 over four. Easy. Now let's do a more complicated system of linear equations. That's just kind of a lot to take in at first. If you're ever in doubt, 
on how to approach a problem, just start graphing the equations in Desmos, and it might make more sense once you can visually see them. So, we can only see one line right now. That's because these are the same line. So because they're the same, we essentially just need to come up with the equation for this line to solve this problem. So we know that whatever point we choose has to work for all values of r. Each real number r is the key. So we can just plug in a number for r, let's just say 1, and then that better be a point on both of these lines. So plugging in A is not on our line. Plugging in B, we see that that's on our line. So B is our answer. A really kind of convoluted problem made a lot simpler with Desmos. Now, say you can't remember a concept like circles or exactly what each value in the equation means. Well, Desmos can graph circles too. All right, we have our nice circle. We're trying to find the diameter. Let's see, we can take leftmost point and rightmost point. So that's gonna be one and nine. So our diameter is 8. You can use Desmos for a lot of things. You can use it for pure calculations too. It doesn't have to be graphing related. And this is mainly how I use it now in college. It's just really convenient to have it all typed out for you. You make fewer mistakes that way. So let's look at this one. We're trying to find the like empty space of a sphere inside a cube. So we can do cube volume minus sphere volume. This would be kind of difficult to type out on a calculator, but we know that's the cube volume. Sphere volume is going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed. Our radius is 34. Yep, that's our answer. Extremely simple to plug this in onto Desmos. It's a little harder to do it on the calculator in my opinion, but if you're used to that, then, then don't change your ways too much right before your SAT. Anyway, this is such a powerful tool if you know how to use it, so hopefully I've demonstrated some of the ways that you can use it. So I'll make a more in-depth video on Desmos eventually and how to know when to use it versus when to just do the math in your head because it'll be faster that way. But in general, use it as much as you can or whenever you need to check yourself on anything. Don't be embarrassed to type like two times four into it. We all have those moments. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about today is an updated version of the ritual that I used to do that got me from making multiple careless mistakes on every single section to getting an 800 on the math. And obviously this won't work for everyone, so use what you will of this method and take it with a grain of salt. But in general, I think approaching the math section with this intentional rigor that I'm about to lay out is a very good strategy. So the SAT math tends to go from easy to hard in difficulty as you go through the section, especially now that the second module is adaptive. And while you should be checking your work on as much of the test as you can, it's important to know which problems you should be focusing your checking energy on, since you have a limited amount of time. For the extremely simple problems that you do really fast and are super confident in, instead of just moving on to the next question right away, make sure you do a little double check on yourself, either by plugging the answer choice back into the problem, making sure you solve for the right thing, reading the question one more time, rounded properly. Just make sure there's absolutely no way you could have screwed up anything anywhere. This type of problem is almost hard to double check since it's so simple, but just do that double check anyway to make sure you didn't go wrong anywhere. It'll take two seconds. Now the second level of question I'd say is the majority of the test. This is any problem that has multiple steps in it or challenges you even a little bit. Sometimes if you're even a little bit challenged by a problem, you could be making a simpler mistake along the way because you're so focused on getting the harder part of the problem right. This is where I made the majority of my mistakes. So anything that's challenging like this, you should go back later and check it only after you're done with the whole section. Giving your brain time to work on other things instead of checking it right away will make it easier to catch mistakes or approach the problem in a new way when you come back to it. So for the digital SAT, I'd recommend marking all of these problems as for review with the little flag icon, even if it leads to an excessive amount of flags. Then only unflag the question once you go back through that second run and check them later. Now the final tier of question is anything that you've worked on for over a minute or so and you just don't see a solution. Any question that's super confusing, not clear right away how you're gonna approach it. These questions will probably tend to be more towards the end of the sections. Don't freak out if you encounter more of these in the second module than the first. That's a good sign that you're doing well and the SAT is adaptively trying to challenge you. So I would say leave all of these questions unanswered for now. Don't waste too much time pondering over them, since what usually happens is once you've had time to process the question and take a little break, you'll have a fresh perspective when you come back and it'll be easier. So once you finish the first run through of the section, go back to all those second tier questions that you still need to check, double check them all and unflag them as you go through them. You can double check by either plugging things in on Desmos if you solved it by hand, approaching the problem in a new way, or for the simpler ones in this category, just double checking that you solve for the right value, <laughs> things like that. This should at the very least give you a confidence boost or make you feel really relieved if you caught a wrong answer that you made somewhere. After you do this, go back to all those unanswered questions and try your best. 
or alternatively, if you find yourself short on time, just go back to them after a certain set amount of time checking this section. That's kind of up to you how much time you want to leave for these. Just figure out what works best for you. If you're aiming for a perfect 800 on the math section, I would recommend aiming to get those highest level questions that you leave unanswered at first down to about one to three. And then ultimately you should be able to solve all of those with the little bit of extra time you give yourself at the end. If you're not aiming for perfection, know that you've gotten pretty darn close. You can be confident with all the questions that you answered, which is much better than not knowing where to direct your double checking energy or spending like 10 minutes on a question that you don't know how to solve. And you could have been solving 10 other easy questions in that time. This strategy is also better than spending way too much time checking the easiest questions in the test that are basically gimme's. Although you still do wanna make sure you're getting those right. This strategy is awesome because it guarantees that you've double checked every single question on the test by the end. So theoretically, you should be getting an 800 if you can get through that whole process and you didn't make the same mistake twice. Obviously the biggest issue with this strategy is time. So if you don't have enough time at the end to do all of this, you can cut your review of the second tier questions shorter to give yourself more time to work on the harder questions or just review the hardest of the second tier questions. So mark fewer of them for review. But ideally, if you're aiming high, you should make it so you have enough time to complete this entire strategy. Now, if you're struggling with this, recognizing the strategy you need to solve a problem, using Desmos as much as possible and using a couple special tricks here and there and just getting a little bit better at the fundamentals of the test can really help shave off time. In my early testing days, I used to just sit and not really know what to do, so I'd just take a little break when I finished the section, when I thought I was done checking all my work. But you really shouldn't do this unless your brain really needs a break. Because remember, any time you spend checking your work has the potential to increase your score. While any time you spend not doing anything and sitting there, while it's good for refreshing your mind for the upcoming sections, it's not gonna increase your score at all. So power through as much as you can, think of that two or so hour testing window as a high intensity sprint where you have to stay as focused as you can to show how much you know and show how much time you spent learning and preparing for this exam. I think that's the majority of my advice for the math modules. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll try to answer them in the comments down below. And also feel free to leave any helpful tips for people in the comments. Be sure to check the description of this video for $50 off Prep Scholars ACT or SAT course. And thanks so much for making it to the end of this video. I really hope this was helpful. If it was, you can go watch my digital SAT reading module video if you want some tips on that as well. And good luck on your test. See you later.